Hi, welcome to Left Foot Media. My name is Brendan Malone. Well, I've just finished reading the book The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, Islam by Douglas Murray. Now, before I get to the meat and potatoes of my review, let me point out a couple of important facts before I get started. First of all, this book is not anti-Islam. This book is not anti-immigration. Uh, this book is not written by someone who's a fascist or a Nazi or a far-right or alt-right or ultra-white nationalist. He's none of those things. Uh, this book is written in a very dispassionate, very what I would call a very English way. Uh, he just presents the facts and effectively says, OK, chaps, here's the cold, hard reality. Uh, pour me another cup of tea. It's, it's very English in the way it's written, but it presents a very solid factual case that's backed by a lot of research, including the fact that Douglas Murray has actually been to a lot of the places, the ground zeros, that were affected in the last couple of years with this massive and overwhelming tide of immigrants, asylum seekers, refugees that swamped different parts of Europe, particularly Western Europe, over the last couple of years. So this is a man who's done his research, he's dispassionate, it's not sensationalistic, he's not making rash claims, and he, as I said, is not opposed to immigration and he's not opposed to Islam. This is simply a book that is presenting the case for why the approach that Europe has taken, uh, particularly, as I said, Western Europe, has taken to uh, immigration and to opening its borders and not enacting sound, evidence-based or prudent policies around immigration and the handling of refugees and asylum seekers and other things, is, has actually created a very, very serious problem in Europe, a very serious crisis that now actually threatens the continued existence of Europe as we know it. Now, like you said, it's, it's not a problem if the ethnic uh, diversity or makeup of Europe were to change. That's not the real issue. The issue here is that what you've got is a large and growing number of people who are living in Europe who are not enculturating. They are bringing a completely foreign culture that's not just diverse, but is completely opposed to a lot of the fundamental freedoms and respects for human dignity and the human person uh, that we just take for granted in the West. And the problem is that sooner or later, that's going to boil over and there's either going to be a major clash within Europe of two different groups of people or what's going to happen is there is going to be a complete loss of those basic freedoms and those important uh, rights and, and respects for human dignity and, and human equality and everything else that are not part of this uh, foreign culture that is not actually enculturating, uh, enculturating well into Europe. And I'll explain more in a second why this is not happening. He explains why uh, really this wave of immigration has really hit Euro Europe at a very, it was almost like a perfect storm. It hit, hit Europe really at the wrong time for Europe because Europe was struggling uh, in a major way with its own identity. And so you've got a big group of people who come in who have a clear sense of identity coming into a culture where they have lost their sense of identity and there's a rampant individualism and a breakdown in a whole lot of key areas, family and societal concern and other things. And that group of people come into your society and they say, well, we've got meaning, we've got clear direction, uh, we have family, we have community. Uh, why would we trade that away for what you're offering? We'd rather do our own thing and stay in your society doing our own thing. And of course, so that this has created this perfect storm. He points out some of the effects of this perfect storm and some of the problematic, uh, as I said, it's a very evidence-based case that he makes. Uh, things like, for example, the fact that despite the fact that it's been illegal for a very long time now, uh, and despite the fact that 130,000, probably more than 130,000 British women now, uh, British females have experienced female genital mutilation, there has not been a single successful prosecution of that crime. And like he says, if we can't handle that in our culture, then how are we going to handle the much bigger challenges that this uh, Islamic uh, uh, culture that has uh, seeded itself in Europe and which doesn't want to change is actually presenting to Europe? So things like, for example, the way in which Europe has not handled well the rape gangs that uh, became a big problem over the last couple of years. And also prior to that, things like the child rap rape uh, syndicate that was happening in the UK and which was covered up by the authorities because there was this fear that somehow it would be racist 
on, on their part to actually highlight that there was one particular community that was committing these atrocious sexual crimes. And so nothing was done about it for a very, very long time. And a lot of young people became the victims of these heinous crimes because of the European attitude uh, that had sort of crept in around not wanting to offend particularly Islam. Obviously, he talks about the jihadist attacks that have happened when we've seen a lot of them, uh, the rise of anti-Semitism, the fact that some formerly peaceful European countries uh, are having to do things like have local non-Jewish European people escort Jews to and from synagogues uh, because of the threats and the abuse and everything else that they were facing. Um, the fact that now in Europe you have this big problem with Muslim on Muslim violence and the fact that, like he talks about, you've got uh, groups that are clearly not uh, good uh, Islamic groups, they are, uh, they are militant uh, and more extreme, are actually finding shelter and the freedom to operate and to thrive in Europe. And meanwhile, a lot of uh, Muslim minorities and, and more vulnerable Muslims are finding themselves at the mercy of this. And particularly those Muslims who dare to speak out and say, hey, we've got a problem here and Islam needs to adjust uh, because otherwise the West is, West is going to be in trouble. Those Muslims are actually... Uh, now forced into situations where they're driven out of Europe by those other Muslims who really don't want to peacefully disagree with them. Uh, or they're under constant uh, state protection by various European countries because they need protection from other Muslims who want to do great harm to them simply for doing something we in the West take for granted and consider actually quite important. That, that's the freedom to actually criticise, to speak your mind, to, to challenge different ideas. As I said, basically what you've got here is a, is a failure to, to integrate and to enculturate. And, and what's happened is uh, this has created a huge and growing problem. Uh, for example, as the book highlights, in 2015, there were more British Muslims. So that's British people who identify as Muslims. There were more British Muslims who were fighting for ISIS than there were British Muslims who were fighting for the British armed forces. That should be ringing alarm bells, right? Uh, another example he cites was when you had the of these sort of contradictions and problems that are really starting to arise with the lack of integration. When uh, in 2016, there, there was a big wave of Eritreans who came out of Eritrea and escaped into Europe. And a lot of them, they sought asylum, right? And, and the Europeans uh, were told that, that they were running from this horrific and brutal regime and they needed asylum. And obviously people's hearts went out to them and doors were opened. But then in 2016, when the United Nations uh, accused uh, Eritrea, the leaders of Eritrea, of, of crimes against humanity, thousands of Eritreans who were living in Switzerland turned up to Geneva and protested outside the United Nations. Now, that, that should be raising some questions, because why would they be protesting against the very government that supposedly they were fleeing from because it was a perpetrator of human rights abuses. And, and when the UN actually acknowledges that fact and says that they are a perpetrator of human rights abuses, all of the Eritreans, or not all of them, but large numbers, thousands of Eritreans who are living in Europe actually turn out to protest the UN for saying this. This is clearly a problem here that, that you've got a lack of integration happening. The other thing that he does in the book, and I think this is really important, is he debunks some of the arguments that people commonly use to try and justify like an open border or a very lax approach to immigration and, and uh, who you let into your country. He debunks uh, the economic argument, for example, because you'll often hear people saying, look, our economies need all these extra people. And so it's, uh, immigration is actually a really good thing because it bolsters our economy. And basically, as he points out, that, that's true if you get the right sort of immigrants uh, the majority of the immigrants coming to your country are the right sort of people, the people who are actually going to invest back into your economy and not going to require any or too much uh, out of the ordinary from the economy itself. But that's not what Europe has seen a lot of, particularly in the last couple of years. That That's not how uh, or not what your average immigrant, if you like, economically, their profile has been like. It, it's been the other way around. There's been a lot more of a requirement from the state. Uh, from those immigrants. Uh, he goes into a lot more detail, obviously, about why that economic argument is problematic. He also talks about the moral arguments that people try and make and, and things around diversity and, and why we need lots of diversity. And he says, look, diversity is not a problem, but there is only so much diversity. It's not like uh, 
you know, the more people you get from different populations, uh, you know, coming into your country, and the greater those various populations grow, the the more of there's a sort of like a benefit from that diversity. That's not how diversity works, and uh, it's it, it's not like all of a sudden because we've got lots and lots and lots of people now from say Syria or, I don't know, from Afghanistan, that all, all of a sudden we have now got even more of a benefit from uh, a diversity benefit here. You see, that's not how diversity actually works. And, and there is a limit to what and how diversity actually shapes uh, our culture in a positive way. And if you cross over those limits, you can have problems, as I said, particularly if you don't have integration. Um, basically, uh, what he really does in the book is he shows how open borders have led to uh, a lot of, uh, exploitation of vulnerable people, even people from those uh, particular nations who have been fleeing into Europe. So, for example, once word gets out, and this is where he has done a lot of research, once word gets out that your country has an open border, then what happens is it really is uh, open season for those people who are unscrupulous who want to run these smuggling operations. Because what they do is they charge people back in their homelands a lot of money, and then they, they say to them, look, hey, they'll take you over in England, they'll take you in Switzerland, they'll take you in Sweden, wherever it is that you know that the open door is, they'll take you. They charge an exorbitant amount of money. They send people on very dangerous journeys by sea. A lot of people were dying on those journeys because uh, very much because of this, the way in which the immigration policy was so poorly handled in Europe. A lot of people were dying on those journeys. And this, the reason was because the smugglers were given open license by the Europeans, and the European governments, in the way they failed to handle this problem properly. And so basically, this overwhelming desire to be humanitarian without any sort of prudence actually results in harm. It's not a good thing. And then on those journeys, a lot of smugglers did all sorts of horrific things to people on the journey, and they would film it, and then they would send the footage back to the families back in these... Middle Eastern or African nations, and they'd say, oh, well, if you don't give us more money, these horrible things will keep happening to your relative. It, it's just like, it, it really, it reads like a, a tale of woe. A lot of, there's some pretty confronting facts about what happened and what has been happening uh, in Europe as a result of this. Uh, one thing that I think he does really well is explains why this uh, immigration policy has been allowed to go on for so long in such a problematic way. And no, it's not a conspiracy theory. He's not, as I said, this is not someone who's proposing some sort of ultra nationalism. He's not a white nationalist. He's not a he's not a white supremacist. He's not a Nazi or a fascist. Uh, the idea of immigration is not a bad thing. Uh, the problem is unchecked immigration, poorly controlled borders, and poor immigration policy is really where a lot of the issues lie. But and he highlights why this has been allowed to go on for so long. And basically what you've got is the situation where there is a mix of guilt amongst a lot of European people, uh, particularly from World War II, and the failure to actually uh, treat the Jewish people well when they were refugees running from uh, the Nazi regime. And so see, there's a lot of guilt around that, particularly in places like Germany, which have really led the charge on the recent approach to immigration. There has also been a big problem with a failure to actually understand by Europeans to actually understand their own European culture and to be connected with it. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And on top of that, there's a couple of false beliefs that people have embraced. One is a false belief that uh, that pretty much everything about Europe, or and particularly its past, is is some sort of evil atrocity, and that you know everything European is bad, and it's colonialism and slavery and oppression, and it's this complete failure to actually understand the truth of human history. Most cultures have great evils in their past. The, the European culture is not unique in this regard in any way. But for some reason, there's this false belief that it is and, and, and that sort of everything Europe has done is bad and evil and nasty. And these people completely forget about all the good things that European culture did as well. And on top of that, there's this false belief that a lot of people hold that, that Europe really has no culture. And so somehow you're importing culture um, by bringing in other nations and you're filling a cultural vacuum. It's not true that Europe has no culture. Uh, the problem is that a lot of Europeans don't actually understand and are not connected to their true cultural heritage anymore. And so they mistakenly believe there's no culture there. They don't actually understand what it is, this great storehouse of, of cultural uh, treasures that they're actually sitting on. Now, what's interesting is he highlights the fact that there's a difference between uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. 
because the major players in Eastern Europe did not buy into the same poorly thought out and very imprudent immigration policies. They actually controlled their borders a lot better. And as a result, they haven't had anywhere near the same level of problems that are manifesting and have been manifesting themselves in Europe. And on top of that, these Eastern European countries still have a strong connection to their Christian heritage, whereas a lot of the Western European ones have lost that connection to their Christian heritage and are struggling with a whole sense of identity. These other countries are not. And he talks about the fact that he thinks a big reason for this is the fact that those Eastern European countries have only just recently, in the last couple of decades, come out from under another evil oppressive regime, which was obviously communism. And so they understood the danger of actually holding on to what is important and valuing those freedoms and those uh, those basic rights and that respect for human dignity. And, and, and they've also still got the cultural heritage because they really had to fight for that under the, all those atrocious years of living under the evil and the barbarism of communism. And so for them, they're a lot more keenly aware of what's at stake here and the risks. Uh, and, and they also have a stronger sense of their identity, which I thought was a really interesting point, And it's well worth, I think, pointing out. Like I said, this is not anti-immigration. It's not anti-Muslim. In fact, in the book, he decries some of the things that have been happening at the grassroots level, because basically the, the governments in, in Western Europe have ignored this problem or downplayed it or pretended it's not a problem. And then they've attacked people who have said there is a problem and accused them of being racist and xenophobic and, and fascist and until basically those words have no more meaning because they, they throw them around so liberally now. Um, that basically it's it's added to this problem, and which he he criticises people, for example, who at the grassroots are referring to refugees as rape fugees or refugee hardists, and he says that's a problem because what they're doing is they're claiming that everyone who turns up as a refugee or as an immigrant uh, is tarred with the same brush. They're all equally bad and problematic. And he said obviously that's not true, but. The problem is that that perception has been created because of the governments and their failure to act prudently and properly around this issue. Basically, what he's proposing is that we need to, some some urgent changes, really, in Europe. So uh, more humane border controls, basically, are what he's suggesting. Ones that balance the needs of those who are incoming, those people who are seeking asylum, those people who are seeking refugee status, those people who are refugees who are running from something, are balanced against the needs of the Europeans who currently live in Europe because they are also human persons with equal dignity and worth in this equation as well. And they do need to be considered. And you can't simply rob Peter to pay Paul, which is effectively what's been going on. And not only that, but this unwillingness to acknowledge the problem is actually starting to create all sorts, all sorts of issues in Europe. Let me quote you something I think was, which is actually quite pertinent that he says in the book. If you pretend for long enough that in the face of clear evidence that all the arrivals into your continent are asylum seekers, you will eventually spawn a movement that believes that none of them are. So in other words, the European authorities and their refusal to accept that they have got problems and that a lot of people who have been let into Europe shouldn't have been let into Europe. Basically what that does is, is it creates such scepticism amongst the general public that they effectively they start embracing this idea that no one is worthy of immigration, that no one is worthy of refugee status or asylum seeker status. And that obviously is a real problem. Now here's basically, there's sort of um, some key ideas that he proposes for what should have been done differently or what should be done differently. So first of all, uh, what he suggests is that refugees should be housed closer to home. They should actually be located when they seek out a place to stay and escape from some sort of atrocity, they should actually be housed and located closer to their home country where the problem has actually arisen. So if they're in the Middle East, they should have their neighbouring Middle Eastern countries who have their act together, who are actually the first port of call. And that's where those refugees should be seeking refuge. And he, he's not saying this to say, oh, well, Europe should get off scot-free. He explains why this is actually a far more prudent policy for all sorts of reasons. And obviously, most importantly of all, first of all, your refugees and asylum seekers don't have to go on long, arduous and dangerous journeys to get to a safe destination. That They, they can find safety a lot closer. Uh, secondly, they are not going to struggle to uh, to integrate into a culture that is much more familiar to them. It would be like you or I running from our Western nation 
into Afghanistan and trying to seek refuge there. It would be such a foreign culture, it would be really difficult for us and it would create all sorts of issues for us. Whereas if we could actually seek asylum in a closer Western nation, that would be far better for us. We'd have a lot more in common and that would actually be a good thing for us uh, as, as refugees on the run. Not only that, but economically it makes more sense. You can actually help more people by helping refugees closer to the source of the problem than you can by exporting them to countries like you know, big parts big, uh, and big swathes into parts of Europe, where the cost involved is a lot more. And so your, effect, your aid is no longer as cost effective. You can't actually help as many people as effectively. Now, he's not saying the West should get off scot-free here. What he's saying is that the West should actually look at ideas and concepts and policies such as Western aid money being used to fund refugee camps and refugee resettlement and other things in those neighbouring countries. So Europe would still be part of this, it's just that they wouldn't be hosting the refugees. They would be instead using funds to make sure that those refugees are being looked after closer to home. And on top of that, what it means is when the, the crisis in their home country dies down, it's, it's a lot easier and quicker for them to actually go back to their home. These are their homelands. Why should they not be able to easily and quickly go back to their home? Uh, the other thing he talks about is the fact that uh, asylum seekers, you know, refugees, they should not have been processed inside Europe. Again, uh, refugees and asylum seekers wouldn't have had to have made the dangerous and arduous journey. Uh, what Europe should have done is they should have had Europe, uh, a European uh, processing stations in other parts of the world or outside of Europe that allowed them to actually process people and to have an ordered and controlled form of immigration. As a result of the way they did it, there's a lot of people who just came into Europe and then sort of disappeared into the system. And they gamed the system. They worked the system. They knew how to do it. He, he, he describes in great detail all of the different shenanigans that went on to game the system. You know, re refugees and immigrants knew you don't apply for asylum seeker status at this particular particular point of the journey because you could get turned away. Uh, so what you do is you wait till you get into this country and then you do it there. And it's a lot harder for them to get rid of you. These were all these tricks that started to develop. There were pamphlets and information that were being given to them before they even arrived in Europe about what to say, about where to go, about what to do to get the best result. Uh, there were huge questions about a lot of these so-called immigrants too. A lot of these supposed children were actually males who didn't look like children and they deliberately destroyed their documentation so it's hard to verify their age, but clearly they were not children you know, looking at them. And so all of these problems arose because of this poorly controlled immigration policy and the fact that they didn't actually vet and manage the uh, incoming immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers and everyone else outside of Europe. They brought it all into Europe and that just created and amplified all, the, all sorts of problems. And the last and really most important point that this book makes, and I think this is the really pressing point, is that basically uh, the West needs to, desperately needs to rediscover the truth that uh, Christianity is just fundamental to our heritage in the West. That basically if it wasn't for Christianity, we would not have the... Uh, the inheritance, the, the democratic rights and freedoms that we all enjoy and take for granted today. Now, he's not, this guy's an atheist, by the way. Douglas Murray is an atheist. He's not a Christian. He's not saying, hey, everyone should be Christian. What he's saying is we need to actually stop acting like Christianity is an enemy of free, open, democratic societies. <clears throat> the exact opposite is true. As he highlights and points out quite strongly, without Christianity, there would be no modern democratic state. There's none of the freedoms, uh, human equality, human dignity. These things are exclusive and they arise from Christianity. And the fact that this is part of the problem he talked about in the book, that uh, this wave of immigrants really hit Europe at the same time where we had lost touch with our identity. And so we didn't really, there's a big meaning gap that exists there. Um, and this is a big problem. The the human experience is very much governed by the search for meaning, the search for purpose. And you cannot pretend that that doesn't exist. And you cannot uh, simply say, oh, well, we don't need Christianity or Christianity is some backwards, outdated way of thinking. No, Christianity is the fundamental story that has shaped the Western world. And our lives are shaped on stories everything about us as individuals, as societies, they are shaped on the back of stories, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And we have abandoned our foundational story. 
like I said, he's not saying everyone has to be a Christian. What he's saying is we need to have greater appreciation and respect for that heritage. And it, they're actually, uh, he quotes Pope Benedict at one point who, who said that basically you need to act as if God really exists, even if you believe that he doesn't. And that's the fundamental thing here, understanding that you can't have a culture of relativism. You can't have a culture where uh, people are just making up reality on the fly. It just does not work. If you want to have a cohesive, united, flourishing society that has where people have a sense of purpose and where your society can withstand outside threats and where your society can actually be a meaningful place for people, you can't live in a relativistic vector, vacuum. You can't live in this weird sort of hard scepticism which says, well, you know, how do we know anything for certain? Well, if we don't know anything for certain, then how do you know for certain that we don't know anything for certain? It's a sort of self-refuting proposition ultimately, but it's also very problematic. You can't build a meaningful society on the back of it. I want to give you a couple of quotes from the book. He, he quotes other people. For example, he quotes uh, a guy called Don Cupid from 2008, again, who's an atheist, and Don Cupid said this, Nobody in the West can be wholly non-Christian. You may call yourself non-Christian, but the dreams you dream are still Christian dreams. In other words, these concepts around human rights and freedoms and everything else that we just take for granted. Uh, we are very much formed in a Christian cauldron, if you like. Another quote, this time from Ernest Wolfgang Bockenford, who was one of the leading German legal scholars and a former judge. And back in the 1960s, he said this. Does the free, secularized state exist on the basis of normative presuppositions that it, itself, cannot guarantee? So in other words, all of these human rights and freedoms and this idea of equality and dignity that we all just take for granted, it actually comes to us from a foundation, and that foundation is Christianity. And you can't build the house or reshape the house by taking it off the foundation. You need to keep the foundation even if you want to reshape the house. And the problem is what we've done is we've effectively tried to take a sledgehammer to the foundation, and that's created an even bigger problem here. You've got a wave of people who have come into Europe at the very time when Europe has lost its identity and it's lost sight of this important understanding that he points out in the book that, and remember, um, that Douglas Murray is an atheist. He is not arguing from a religious perspective. But basically, I think it's a very important point that secular liberalism is a branch that has branched off from the tree, from the main trunk, which was Christianity. That's the foundation. That's the trunk that gave rise to it. And you can't sever the limb off and say, look, we've got a new tree now. That's not how that works. Um, again, to go back to that quote from Pope Benedict, behave as though God exists. You know, that's the sort of fundamental thing. Even if you don't believe he exists, you need to actually behave as a society as though he does because that gives all sorts of important protections and it gives you the ability and the foundation you need to be able to weather all of these external threats and these external storms because it gives you a clear sense of your history and a clear sense of identity and cultural heritage and understanding who you are at the deepest part of your society because you really do know where you've come from. You know, you can't have that, as I said, in this sort of relativistic vacuum, this sort of modern Marxist idea that we can sort of now is year zero when we cut ourselves off. This is what Chairman Mao said when he took power. Now is year zero and what has gone before doesn't matter. It doesn't work like that. In a nutshell, I would say that this book is probably one of the most important books that's been written in the last 50 years. And I think uh, based on the way things are going in Europe, that this could well be one of those books that in 100 years time, People are actually looking back on and reading and saying, wow, that was one of those books that didn't get read widely enough by enough people. And it needed to be read by more people because it actually predicted and, and, and was sounding the warning about some big problems that we're facing. This is about someone who is saying, we are in real danger here because of the way that our political and media class have handled this and have basically willingly at times and at other times, for who knows whatever reasons, have been totally out of touch with what the actual majority of people living in these European societies have come to understand and see. It's very easy to, to say there's not a problem when you have the money to insulate yourself against it or you're not living in an area. He talks about, for example, a lot of the celebrities who are like, yeah, let's welcome refugees. And I'll, a lot of them even say, I'll take them into my house. But see, none of them ever did. And it's very easy to, to sound this very humanitarian voice and to be a strong defender of these principles when you don't actually have to live the principles, when you don't have to. It's not, it's not your charity that you're calling on to solve the problem. You're calling on someone else's charity. 
And and so he said a lot of people who are at the grassroots, at the coalface of these European societies, they understand the problems because they are living with the problems day to day. And there's a, a large group of people who can't financially insulate themselves against them. And they have seen the serious ramifications of what is going on. But the political class and the media class have just refused to actually acknowledge this. And that's really only making the problem worse. Um, if we go back to that quote from earlier on where he said this, if you pretend for long enough that in the face of clear evidence that all arrivals into your continent are asylum seekers, you will eventually spawn a movement that believes that none of them are. So in other words, there's this hard scepticism about any genuine refugee that's problematic. But also I'd argue the same is true if you've got a government and a media class and an academic class that keeps calling people fascists and Nazis and racists and white nationalists and everything else simply because they are sounding the alarm and asking pertinent questions about the immigration policy. And basically what happens is you're going to get to a point where your society is going to believe that no one is a white nationalist because you've so liberally thrown this term around and mislabeled all sorts of people that people are actually going to fail to recognize that serious danger if it ever does actually choose to raise its head within your society. Let me finish with the final few sentences of this book because I think this is a really pertinent summation of, I guess, everything which the book goes into in a lot more detail when Douglas Murray says this. Day by day, the continent of Europe is not only changing, but is losing any possibility of a soft landing in response to such change. An entire political class have failed to appreciate that many of us who live in Europe love the Europe that was ours. We do not want our politicians, through weakness, self-hatred, malice, tiredness, or abandonment, to change our home into an utterly different place. And while Europeans may be endlessly compassionate, we may not be boundlessly so. The public may want many contradictory things, but they will not forgive politicians if, whether by accident or design, they change our continent completely. If they do change it, then many of us will regret this change quietly. Others will regret it less quietly. Prisons of the past and of the present, for Europeans, there seem finally to be no decent answers to the future which is how the fatal blow will finally land. It's a pretty powerful and hard-hitting conclusion to his book, but I think it's a pretty fair summation of all of the evidence and the arguments that he puts forward. As I said, I highly recommend this book. If you have embraced a very emotional approach to this issue that hasn't really looked too hard at the evidence, you might well find some of the facts that he presents pretty challenging. But one thing you cannot accuse Douglas Murray of as being some sort of ultra-nationalist or fascist or far-right person you can't accuse him of having some religious you know, anti-Islam agenda. Uh, you can't accuse him of being anti-immigration. And you can't accuse him of not actually having done his homework and presented the facts well. I'd highly recommend this book, The Strange Death of Europe. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time on Left Foot Media.